Counting down. So welcome to the IC Practitioners Program. This is a series that we started a number of years ago and has had a hiatus of just exactly one year. And we've really been missing these conversations about intangible and intellectual capital. And so we're here to start them again. And, and what better way to, to start the conversation than to bring uh, a couple people together. One is Leif Edvinson, who has was one of the early thinkers and has been in this field for many, many years now. And Jay Darragon, someone that's been working with us at Smarter Companies and has been doing a lot of fresh thinking and blogging and writing about intangibles. And so I thought we could talk today about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the subject of GDP and national IC, and of course that's an area that Leif has done a lot of research in. And then finally, in the past few weeks, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, digital capital, a, a concept that McKinsey put out, and a really a, a conversation that's just beginning about is IC going to disrupt the field of management consulting. So let's 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 start with the beginning and and Leif, you were there, you were one of the early thinkers, and I'd love for you to talk about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. So welcome, Leif. Thank you very much. Um, I think that this is a very interesting time for um, looking into the intangibles, uh, regardless if we call it intellectual capital or digital capital or something else because it, it is about the intangibles, it's about a new navigation, and it's about uh, a shift of dominant logic. And um, I think what we also see today is a grower, growing appreciation by the young people for this. Um, perhaps we are heading for something called sustainable intellectual capital, and we are playing with that, and we can come back to that. We call it sustainable national intellectual capital. But definitely it's, it's a kind of, of a restart or a, finding a better word for it, a relaunch of a, this logic of intangibles. And um, this goes not only for McKinsey, it goes for OECD, it goes for the European uh, Commission, it goes for um, governmental agencies like TECAS in Finland and the uh, Ministry of Economics in Japan. So it's a lot of, of um, efforts of um, developing this uh, new mapping. And uh, you can read about the evolution in an article in Journal of Intellectual Capital, which I wrote, uh, uh, and it was published in January this year. Uh, it's called IC21 um, for this century. So there I'm, I'm describing where we have been and, and where we might be. And uh, today I'm actually more interested in what we are, where we are heading, because <laughs> it's my curiosity. <laughs> I know, because that's the way you're always three steps ahead, Leif, but it would be really great if you would give us just a quick synopsis of, of kind of those stages that you've seen in the development of the field. Yes, uh, and um, the core of it is still that it is the combination of human capital and structural capital with the organization and relational capital. Uh, it looks like most financial analysts miss this, and uh, uh, I think uh, the best case I know of is not the Amazon.com that Apple, uh, sorry, that uh, McKinsey is referring to. It's actually App Store. App Store is a publishing house for uh, work done by people who are regarded as unemployed, unemployed. Um, working with the app development. So actually, it's a st tremendous statistical um, uh, distortion here. If you are an unemployed youngster developing a new app, you sell it through App Store, where does it show up in the statistics? Uh, does it show up in the <laughs> employment statistics? Of course not. You are still un unemployed. Does it show up in your wallet? Definitely it does. Uh, but a major proportion is showing up in, in the wallet of app, app store. And therefore, uh, it's a shift. It's a strategic shift of uh, Apple from being a developer to become a publishing house. And a publishing house of software. 
And this is a fundamental shift, which of course is digitalized uh, capital, uh, but this is an, a deep understanding of the IC multiplier, how you might multiply the network of brains around the world to do the um, value creation, um, which is more or less endless. As long as the there's a life in the app, it has a value creation. So uh, is it uh, a traditional accounting cycle of one year, or is it uh, five years of a traditional depreciation cycle or investment calculation? No, it, it's the, the logic of increasing marginal utility. The law of increasing marginal utility. It's, it's Which the is opposite. Of supply and demand, right? That's, that's the, the, everything we were taught in school was about scarcity, and what you're talking about is abundance. Yes, and today we can see that more than 70% in rich countries are coming from the contribution of intellectual capital, more than 70%. And this is extremely interesting. Uh, that is on the national level. And then you can see on the enterprise level, uh, for example, uh, App Store, where it's more than 70%. And, uh, and it, it, so therefore, it's very interesting to see the, the shift of Nokia now that is becoming much more of a networked enterprise than it was uh, when it was a, d a device uh, enterprise. Um, so I would perhaps uh, someday down the road see that either um, uh, Nokia is a smarter company or it was a smart company. <laughs> so, and you know what I love about what you're saying is that, you know, um, especially in the McKinsey article, but also in so many. Uh, articles that you read about different aspects of intangibles, people keep talking about control and thinking that this is something that you can bring inside the enterprise and own and and that you want to do that. But what you're saying is Apple today with the App Store and really with, with what they created with iTunes, it was much more about the relationship capital than it was about the structural digital things that they controlled. It was their ability to attract others. Certainly, and, and as you um, indicate, it's another map that you need to see that the value creation is actually not within the enterprise, it's outside the enterprise. And it is in the leveraging of the network. And that's why it's an increasing marginal utility. It's a multiplier function, but uh, it's so different from the old traditional economics. So, therefore, uh, it's very good that uh, McKinsey is now uh, coming back on the arena with proposing this after some 20 years, um, perhaps emerging insights. We hope so. Although one of the things that that we've noticed in this, and Jay's been writing about this, is that. Uh, while they're talking about this phenomenon, uh, they appear to be blind to, or they're not talking about, how it ultimately disrupts the flow of information that, uh, that uh, traditional consultants controlled information and sold, were able to get paid to tell people about their own businesses, whereas what we're talking about really with a, a new model flips that on its head and the, the consultant doesn't have the knowledge, just as a boss doesn't have the knowledge, it's spread throughout the network. You know, yes, and, and that is the ro new role for the consulting um, enterprises. It, it is in the networking function. It's so not in the know, function. Jay you know, talked about this yesterday. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, it's interesting to hear your comments because one of the things McKinsey says in their article is that it's, it's difficult to identify intangible assets. That's not true anymore. Second is that knowledge has become a commodity that's turned into an app. Knowledge is now readily available. You can get it if you look for it. But it's the transformation of knowledge into skills and thus into wisdom which is the data analysis, which is the interpretation of what the knowledge is trying to tell people, it, it, the synthesization of it, if you will, that is, is happening because of the technology. And that is an intangible thing that's going on that most people don't see because they try to put it into their tangible box. 
and it's happening everywhere. Like you mentioned, the app store, and what people are doing is they're, they're creating tools to process knowledge faster. They're creating tools to visualize things that before were never visualized. You know, everybody's talking about big data. You know, what Mary's done is said, look, let's go collect data from stakeholders. And those are the people that tell us what's meaningful and valuable in terms of their relationship with an organization. And those things that are meaningful and valuable are those intangibles. I, you know, I want to say that, that Leif is one of the first people to do that, to say that the best way to measure your intangibles is to go to your stakeholders. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, like, is that the Business Week article recently said that uh, businesses are have got a pent up amount of money, and their their uh, management consulting is growing because businesses need help in the following areas. Areas they need help in improving operations, sales and marketing, and digitalization. So I read the article and I said, I wonder why they chose those things. Did they ask their stakeholders? Probably not. No. They just looked at it and said, this is where we're going to squeeze more money out of. And if you ask the stakeholders, the stakeholders would probably not choose those three things. And that's why we need new navigators. Right. And um, as you recall, 300 years ago, the, the most valuable function in the um, kingdoms of Europe uh, was the, the map maker. Ah. Uh before U.S. was discovered. Yes. And, and therefore, it, it's very interesting to see that the, the map makers of today are living in, um, to a large degree, in um, the dark ages in U.S. <laughs> very interesting. So therefore, uh, who will be the, the new um, yeah. uh, discoverers of the stakeholders of tomorrow? So, so to me, that that speaks to a different function wow. for the consultant. That the consultant truly really has to become a facilitator to help the flow of, of communication with the stakeholders, not to not to be the decider and the judge of of what the right answer is. Yes, and and to add to that, you can also talk about that the function of, of the consulting uh, job will be to reduce ignorance. Yes. So how do you do that, Leif? Open your eyes, uh, open your ears, um, connect with um, more eyes and more ears and more hearts. So you go from contactivity to, uh, sorry, you go from connectivity to contactivity. So I'm curious, when we talk about this, I mean, one of the things that we, we hope that we can add value with in these conversations with stakeholders is providing a framework that's flexible enough but but touches on all the important pieces and you know you mentioned at the beginning I mean the, there's this basic framework that's been around for a couple decades now human relationship structural and you know we call it strategic I think you call it um, you used to call it business recipe but but the concept that there are these different kinds of knowledge, these different kinds of um, uh, collaboration and connection. Uh, is that, how do you feel about the framework? Is it still work? Or do we have the right framework? Should to a large degree, we have the framework, but we don't have the details yet. Um, so if you apply the framework to understand where the value creation in App Store is, uh, taking place, um, it still works because it's in the networking capital. Um, but it's also in the innovation capital of app, uh, on Apple. And um, therefore, um, it looks like we are also heading to um, a deeper understanding of the IC multiplier with new indicators and new maps. And, and we are exploring that um, in um, some booklets with Springer. Uh, where we are applying the outlook or trajectories for national intellectual capital. So you, act, you can actually do a forecast, like a weather forecast. And if you do this comparison with weather reporting, um, some um, 30 years ago, the weather reporting was not so precise as it is today because of the satellites. 
Uh, and it's a paradox that we have uh, uh, GPS systems in our pockets for uh, to go from one block to another block, but we don't have it for accounting. <laughs> I like it. But so um, I'm curious. Wait, you just used the term innovation capital. Uh, is that a a separate category, separate asset, or is it a perspective on the other elements? It's probably a separate one because capital, to start with, uh, the the meaning of the word capital is head. It's Latin. Uh, however, the, the the concept was hijacked by Adam Smith and some others later on to re reduce the importance of it to, to be only financial capital, but actually it's head value. And the head value is more, more than ever the capability to see new things, to connect new things, to um, uh, be healthy, etc. And that is the innovation capital. So the renewal dimension of an enter enterprise or a nation is absolutely um, probably a separate category as we move on. And we started to do that work on in Scandia Future Center many years ago. Uh, and today it, it is um, somewhere around 20 different uh, future centers as well as other similar organizations to reduce the fear to move into the unknown. So I, I wonder if you're not talking about, in many ways, what, what Jay's been trying to get at when he's talking about um, the path to wisdom, that uh, the ability to synthesize what's happening and then, then take, you know, move it forward. And I love the word renewal as well. Well, I, I think that the, I love what he's saying because I love studying the minds of the youth now. And they reject the paradigms of the past. They don't want to go work for the man. They want the freedom to express ideas and create new things. And they're rejecting the old industrial model as business. And the old school people are having difficulty comprehending, well, what else is there? And, and, the, and the youth is, is out there creating value. And, you know, th there's all kinds of labels on it being the social era, the knowledge era, whatever. But like the App Store example that you're using, there are people creating value, and there are people that have come out of schools with MBAs, gone and gotten these huge jobs, but the jobs are killing them and their families, and now they're leaving the jobs to find freelance work, to find work that keeps them at home more, so that they're expressing themselves better. And they're, they're connecting with their inner self and they're creating things that they never knew they could create that add to an economy that they never knew was out there. Precisely, so and therefore, what you start to see is that the whole concept of unemployment is probably a, a blocked street, actually. Uh, because it, it's a statistical phrase um, where you're measuring people who are not employed. Uh, right, but right. If, if the youngsters of today don't want to be employed, uh, how do you adapt as a politician? And how are you going to tax these people who are unemployed, creating values in a network that shows up somewhere in another region of the world? Right. So speaking of other regions, Leif, let's let's talk for a little bit. Uh, you've done a lot of research. How many countries? I, I, I'm not sure. I'll let you say that you've done calculations of their national IC, and I'd love you to to explain what you've done and and what you've learned and and where you where you think that we can uh, apply this this wisdom. Well. Uh First of all, it's probably not wisdom yet, but it might be. <laughs> um, you are very lucky to be in a leading country called USA, because USA is among the top 10 countries in the world. We have investigated now 48 countries. We are adding roughly one or two countries per year. We started with 40. So therefore, the website where you can learn more about it is called uh, nic40.org. Uh, which was uh, referring to that it was 40 countries. Uh, and um, 
the, the pattern is very interesting because the pattern is that US is still uh, very high but then it's small countries like the Nordic countries and especially Singapore and, and Switzerland that are on in this top league actually. Switzerland is number six and the uh, US is number one and in between is uh, um, Singapore and the Nordic countries. Uh, and is there some kind of, of um, reason why it's small countries? Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps not. Uh, it, it is about the relational capital. It is about the, the processing of intangibles. And um, if you look into the details, I see as a part of GDP, which is also referred to some extent uh, in the McKinsey article. For US, um, it, it is 70% uh, of the US um, uh, in GDP is related to intellectual capital, 70%, which is extremely high. So therefore, you can ask the question, what is the IC policy making in Washington? <laughs> uh, and um, for Sweden, it's even higher, 72%. Um, and uh, for EU uh, uh, as a group, it is 52%. So, so you start to see a pattern with 70% uh, for, for roughly for rich countries. Um, uh, and for poor countries, it's only 34%. So to bring up the poor countries to a higher level of wealth uh, and um, well-being, we have to increase the IC policies. But where, in what country in the world do you see a Ministry of IC? I you think the Ministry of Finance. That's been one of the uh, really interesting things that I've learned in the in the last uh, number of years. It, especially, I, very early in my career, I worked in the development field, and I think uh, we traditionally thought of the difference in wealth between countries as being a question of tangible wealth, and the fact that it's really about the intangibles, it's about the institutions, the trusts, the laws, um, things like that. I'd love to hear, you know, what you think some of the key variables are there. Well. Where we could continue on the story of apps. Uh, one of the most uh, um, dynamic apps in Africa of today is Med Africa. In Med Africa, you can find uh, a suitable doctor um, at a close distance for the health conditions of yourself and also recommendations partially on what to be done. And if you think about that uh, as digital capital, it's remarkable. Med Africa developed in, in an region called Silicon Savannah in Kenya, but applied over the southern part of the, the whole continent of Africa, Med Africa. Uh, another very interesting uh, illustration is a hole in the wall. It was developed as a prototype by Professor Mitra at MIT. He just opened a hole in the wall in India and let the, the um, young people in, in that village connect to the world. They didn't know English, they didn't know about software, they didn't know about how to use the device, but after a couple of months uh, they got acquainted with it and they started to have a new school. And this school has shown in comparative research have a higher productivity than MIT as a university. Yeah, that school just won the uh, TED Award and got millions of dollars of grants, and they call it the school in the clouds. Yes. So it, that is what we see, actually, that there, there is um, a new institutional framework emerging, which is probably digitalized, but it's also about the, the relational capital, because uh, if you take the Asian perspective, knowledge is not on the bookshelf. Knowledge is in the relationship between people. So it's not an object. It's a relationship. Which is one of the, and you know, that's that's something that we've been talking a lot about, you know, because I've always talked about intangibles as being knowledge assets, but, but that ignores the collaborative and connection. So there's almost, we need a new phrase. It's collaborative knowledge, maybe, is the essence of intangible capital or intangibles. I think well, it's, it's uh, exchange. Yes. <laughs> I think it's, uh, we could start to play with a new taxonomy, which is so important, actually. But yeah. it, it, it's not knowledge. Knowledge is still an object. So it's the knowing, if it should something be something about uh, know. But it, it is probably in um, 
a totally um, new emerging taxonomy which could be a part of this conversation later on to see how do we refine the new words and uh, to see the map and to see the difference and, and uh, this is a part of what we are working with in the new club of Paris as well. Uh, new club of Paris is a kind of think tank for um, the uh, agenda of nations of tomorrow. You know, just the example of this is so unbelievable. In this conversation on on Google Hangouts. Personally, just hearing this conversation quote, what I'm learning, my brain's just firing off is an example of the exchange of knowledge from conversation that from my own nature is making my brain go wild. <laughs> <laughs> so put the hat on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, um, I'll, I'll jump in because one of the, that's one of the interesting things about why we started these conversations and actually the, these IC practitioner conversations were a second generation after an effort that you and others um, uh, w. B. Lee at Hong Kong Polytechnic and and Gordon McConaughey uh, now of Thailand, uh, the three of you and many others had started this effort many years ago, and then uh, we moved it to the IC Knowledge Center. This is almost like the 3.0 version, but th there's such a need for, to help people around the world connect the dots. I think there's so much good work being done in so many different corners of the world and yet we still see people only understanding a piece of the of the story and Leif, I, you know, we're going to, I've committed to getting back, I mean one of the reasons we stopped doing these programs last year was we were having a lot of platform issues uh, but in the interim Google has put out these hangouts and uh, it's wonderful because it goes right to YouTube. I think we're going to need to figure out a chat uh, capability. Yes. But, um, beyond these, you know, monthly conversations, what what can we do to increase the rate of exchange of of uh, understanding and uh, learning uh, among all the people doing this wor this work around the world? Two quick remarks. One is that we, we could probably um, initiate uh, some kind of good quizics, good questions, um, which might help people to start to, to think in, in a different track. And the other one is to nourish cross-generational dialogues. So if we take these young people working in Kenya or in Hong Kong or, or Asia, um, and connect them with uh, seniors from, uh, for example, Scandinavia and the Nordic countries as well as U.S. and have conversation across generations. Well, that's a good idea. We'll have to think about how to make it happen, but I like it. And then the quizics, um, are those things, you're saying questions that we could maybe host on our community and, and uh, put one out periodically to try and get folks yes. to go deeper? You know, uh, Quizix is about partially neuro, uh, neuroscience. A good question um, shapes new synapses. And those synapses stay in your brain until you get Alzheimer. <laughs> so, um, how should we develop the agenda of Quizix? Do you want to give us a few to start? Not this very, well, I guess we could do them. <laughs> if you want to brainstorm now, or we could um, do it as a follow up. I would like to challenge Jay, uh, as he is on top of his head now. Um, how could, it, what questions do you pick up from this conversation? Because I raised probably around ten different questions, and which ones would you like to to start to list uh, related to uh, forthcoming dialogues? Wow, I'd I'd like to do it. I'd like to have time to think about that. Yes, and. I'd like to exchange it between the three of us, and then we can publish it, Mary, and then bring it back around as an open dialogue to examine those questions. Because I think it's worthy of thinking, and then too worthy of deep discussion going forward, which is going to take up some more time. And I think your hang on time is going to run over. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, I like that. So. Um, 
let's just talk uh, for a few minutes about this issue of the management consultants and then we'll have lots of follow-up uh, online but this has been a great spark to to get these conversations going again but uh, as I mentioned Jay put out a, a a post yesterday that was shared over a thousand times on LinkedIn that said uh, the message here isn't just about how digital capital is affecting our clients it's how digital capital is going to affect what we can do and what we should be doing as consultants and uh, I think that's struck a real chord with people because this concept of thinking 2.0 is always the hardest when it's affecting your own world. But I, I do think back to the early lessons I had, Leif, from, from your work and working with you uh, going back close to 10 years ago. And one of the basic concepts that, that you did, and, and frankly I learned as a, as a banker, but we never thought of it as, as a really valid measurement approach, but is to talk to the stakeholders. And I, I, I think the 2.0 version of everything has been coming of journalism, of power sharing in governments and uh, companies. And I think measurement 2.0 is going to come from the stakeholders. And I'd love to hear both of you talk a little bit more about that. One is the dimension of the, the wording of measurement. And as you know, I many years ago coined the, the, that the issue is not measurement, it's me assuring. <laughs> and me assuring is actually um, a navigation approach. So it's actually trying to capture whether you are on the right track with the right speed. Uh, um, and the, most of the metrics of today as well as uh, still um, 2.0 is metrics about the position. Um, but actually it's the relative data that is interesting. And I, I, look at it as, I look at it as, you know, it, it used to be called inside out, but I'm saying it's outside in. And that being that when you look at companies and you look at the traditional practice of management consultants, they go inside and then they look outside to match it up. The problem is that the view of management is from the inside to the outside. And they talk about all this social technology that's engaging the customer and engaging the market, but they're not listening. They're not engaging them really. They're, shape, they're framing the engagement to get to hook them into a transaction. They're not framing the engagement to listen, to understand, to gain that knowledge and wisdom of what is it that we can do to serve you. Now, I'm not saying all of them don't do it. I'm saying most of them don't do it. Mm -hmm. The management consulting world is so driven by let us go research and give you the data and look at things from a data perspective and the problem is that data has not been available on the intangible side. So how can I advise you on what to change in the intangible world when I'm trying to advise you to deal with tangible things? And that's been for doing that for so long that when you start talking about intangibles, their eyes gloss over. And you know, and, and management consultants just say, "Oh yeah, we'll get to that," and then they forget it. <laughs> yes, that's why the ignorant space is growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not quite old enough to be that blunt, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> White mustache is a symbol. <laughs> That's what I keep telling my hairdresser when he wants to act. I, I, I got that over here. <laughs> <laughs> but think, about, think about ignorance, um, the ignorance role of management consulting. <laughs> and this is probably 3.0 that uh, you can ask a question. Why is it uh, that uh, Microsoft or Apple came up with uh, MedAfrica.com? Uh, why was it done by some youngsters in Silicon Savannah? Yeah. Uh, and how does that relate to the um, institutional framework of hospitals in US? When right. will they pick up? 
of medafrica.com. Well, doesn't ignorance kind of fall hand in hand with arrogance? And then arrogance fall hand in hand with money? So, you know, you put the three things together and that reflects the attitudes that came out of the industrial era. So therefore we need a ministry of ignorance. <laughs> Well, but that's ultimately what the 2.0 message is, right? That that um, you're ignorant and, and everyone out there that's empowered and that has a voice through the Internet uh, is going to make it clear how ignorant you are. Yes, yes. So. Tremendous clear. It is that bold. Yeah. Yes. So that's a smarter company, smarter nations, and smarter people. Amen. That's, good. that's, that's the goal. All right, so I, Leif, I, I want to thank you. I, I'm really excited that we were able to kickstart these conversations again. As I said, you you were there for the roots of the IC. You were there for the roots of these IC practitioner talks. And I think um, it's time for us to redouble our efforts and get get things going again. I think you gave us a great action item with the idea of these quizics. So uh, anyone who's watching, uh, stay tuned. We'll we'll start posting those on smarter companies and and get that discussion going. And uh, lots of, of other follow up. We'll write some posts to um, clarify and provide links to the things that Leif mentioned, especially his great research about the IC of nations. And so, I want to say, Mary, thank you for inviting me, Leif. It was an honor to be here to talk with you. Happy future. Thank Thanks, you. Leif. Thanks to both of you, and we'll see everyone again. We're going to start doing this the second Tuesday of every month, um, 9 a.m. Eastern Time in the U.S., which covers almost all the time zones in the, in the world. So, um, as Leif said, happy future, and we'll see you next month. Thanks to you both. Bye-bye.